to open the annual DEF CON convention. This meeting was held in exciting Las Vegas, Nevada from July 9th through the 11th, 1999. This is video tape number 14. Uh, DT has arranged a Meet the Fed panel for the Black Hat briefings, which take place immediately preceding DEF CON. And this year we had such a good turnout of Feds for both Black Hat and DEF CON, we decided to finagle them into sitting up on our panel and interacting with all of us. I will tell you also, I know that, that at least one or two of them went through quite a struggle in getting this cleared at the highest levels of government to be here with us. So first I'd like to introduce you to each of them and give a little history. Probably the most uh, interesting candidate we have here on the panel today is Agent Jim Christie. <laughs> Raise your hands if you've heard of Jim. Oh, <laughs> oh bump, bump. That was Jim was the lead agent in the Hanover Hacker case. And if you haven't heard of the Hanover Hacker case, then there are some books back there in the, in the room that you can take a look at. On my right, we have Phil Loringer, who is with headquarters, office of the... Secretary of Defense, right? Secretary of the Army, um, Information Systems, Command Control, Communications and Computers. And if you put one more word on there, I'm going to run out of breath before I say it. Basically, Phil is, I, I believe, the senior most civilian managing information security programs for the Army. And on the far end is Jeffrey Hunker. Jeffrey Jeff Hunker is with the National Security Council, and he is the senior most person handling information warfare, information security issues. So we have a pretty weighty panel up here, and, and I, I don't mean that as, as a bad thing. <laughs> so without further ado, what I would like to do is go ahead and open the floor to questions after Jim starts off. He's got just a, a small presentation. I told him he has 10 minutes or less and she then said, throw him off the, the microphone. So we'll let Jim start with that. I'm just sitting down. Uh, okay, I'm going to start it off. I'm Jim Christie. Uh, I'm a criminal investigator with the uh, Air Force Office of Special Investigations, and I'm detailed to uh, uh, the Department of Defense. So I can't do anything without a slideshow, so uh, this was major teeth pulling here. So basically it's us versus some of you, but I think, I think you guys are outnumbered here. Uh, so you say you do it for the challenge, the intellectual challenge, and you don't do harm, uh, and uh, you just bring attention to a particular problem. Uh, I think that's bullshit. Okay? So, if you really wanted to challenge, you would have our jobs. Um, you. Instead of saying, most of you. Okay, all you on this side, all us on this side. Um, your targets, if you're on that side, your targets are unlimited. Uh, it's only limited by your imagination where we have to protect everything uh, from you. Uh, you don't have to play by the rules. We do. We're limited only by your imagination again. We're limited by constitution, statutes, treaties, uh, ethics, morality. Absolutely. Just 
can attack whatever you want. We have to protect ourselves 24 by 7 by 365. Um, forget, forget leap year, okay? Um, you can stop attacking any time. We still have to protect all the time. Um, the government, the budgets haven't gone up. So we basically have to do with what we've got. So now we have a whole new mission area to protect these damn things. And um, uh, we're having to cut other things, maybe social programs, uh, to... Um, we're thinking about that. Bottom line is that, you know, whether it's the government that you hit or whether it's a private uh, company that you hit, it all gets passed on to everybody. And you're all going to pay one way or the other. Um, and plus, you had a major head start on us because you're smarter than us. Uh, I so our seniors didn't grow up with this technology. They don't understand it. Uh, so they're just learning about it. So you guys have been out there developing techniques, and uh, the, the uh, uh, technology is exploding and proliferating. And uh, we're just recognizing it's a problem, and, and now it's huge. Uh, and so we're way, way behind you guys. Uh, you guys can align yourself with anybody, whether it's uh, acting alone, joining a group, multiple groups, criminal organizations, terrorist organizations, and nation states. And we have to protect against all of that. Um, your motives are all different. We already talked about challenge. That's bullshit. Uh, uh, you can just be malicious. You could be the same kid I grew up with that went around shooting uh, the BB gun, shooting people's windows and uh, light poles out. The only difference is that now you put uh, national security at risk. Um, so you're curious. You know, there's all kinds of different reasons that you give, uh, but we still have to protect everything from all those different motives. Um, you don't require major resources. Um, try protecting everything. I mean, we really have a major challenge to protect against everything. Um, well, we won't go into this. You could be anybody from the ankle biter to that nation state, and the problem that we have is that we can't tell the difference until we trace it back to where the little son bitch's fingers meet the keyboard. So, uh, you know, we have we have to run every case uh, as if it was a nation state or a terrorist organization. It's not that we target ankle biters; uh, they're probably the only ones we can catch. Um, and we have geographical boundaries. If you think about law enforcement agencies, what we have jurisdiction for, it's always based on geography. A city, a county, a state, uh, a country, uh, where cyberspace has no boundaries. And, um, you know, transcending these bo uh, boundaries and the rules that go along with those boundaries make things really difficult for us. And you could be singularly focused on breaking into a particular system. We have other uh, competing priorities, uh, you know, espionage, murder, terrorism, all these other things to protect you and, you know, most of protect your rights. So uh, in the old days, the challenge was not to get caught. Uh, that wasn't much of a challenge. Uh, but the government is starting to, the light bulb is starting to twinkle uh, a little bit. And so it's going to be a little bit more dangerous for you. Uh, and you don't want to, you know, uh, jeopardize uh, your future employment, your security, and, and even your freedom. So uh, join the good guys, you know? It's not like we don't need the help, okay? And, and oh, by the way, the last slide, you know, hey, we got a major problem coming up with Y2K. Don't kick a cripple. <laughs> It just stirs your patriotic feelings, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. On that note, let's open the floor for questions. Can you, can you please stand up and speak up really loudly? You guys are technologically in the know for some of the state networks. Do you agree with the current litigation that's happening as far as making even an attempt at hacking or uh, breaking into anything illegal? And not breaking into anything that they want to be an attempt to do so? And actually, I want to go 
taking that into. Doesn't that make you feel like things are going to be left wide open for people that are actually pushing for state secrets and malicious acts? Yeah, what what was the, what exactly was the question? You would you attempting to make the easy attempt to break into a system illegal and have political consequences. And litigation meaning that somebody could sue you? No, that litigation is when you sue for civil purposes. You mean legal like prison? We're talking like 39, 50 years just for trying to attempt to No, you can sit I tried. Plain English here for the crowd, all right? Uh, can everybody hear me? Go good. Uh, I'm not familiar with the litigation you're referring to. Uh, I do think it's important that we protect privacy rights for all Americans. And that is an important part of what makes our nation what we are. It's an important part also of what, why there is a number of terrorist groups and there's a number of nations out there that are starting to look at cyber attack as a means of, of hurting us. And I'm for everything that's going to protect the rights of Americans to be secure with the information that they put into trusted hands, whether that's going to be uh, information they share with their employer or information that uh, they share with the government. And if protecting those rights means making the job of people who are breaking their legally into systems harder, I think that's a good thing to be doing. That was a very good question. Basically, in summary, he said, does the government consider personal responsibility when you place information on the internet for securing that information, correct? Or is the responsibility for the insecure placement of that information in the hands of the groups who are able to exploit the vulnerabilities that are there? Yeah, like, it's pretty much an open thing. It's pretty much your fault and their fault. Because you know what game you're getting into on the internet. Is there anything you guys kind of learned that make that a little bit more about that, the, um, the analogy I would make is uh, you shouldn't punish somebody for not locking their house and you breaking into the, walking into their house and going through their file cabinet. Uh, that's still, you know, illegal entry. So, and violating their rights. As far as I can open this on the internet, you guys are making it a little bit safer for people to not get out of the commission so loud. But I think part of that is an education problem. Uh, people people think think the internet's secure. You know, you got this is a whole different group. Of, you guys understand what goes on. It's a it's a party line, whereas uh, most people don't understand that. They think they're on the telephone. Guy in the red stood up first. Uh, my question is: If uh, all these hackers here inside the U.S. start hacking other countries in the U.S. Uh, Ask the international panel of government experts that will be here next year.
let's look at this as two separate issues. The first issue, that was, which was a very valid question, was what is the difference in endorsing activities against countries that we are actively involved in hostile actions with versus the government's response to our, our, our own citizens conducting such activities. Was, was that basically your question? I'll take a crack at it. The, as for the reports about what uh, did or did not take place in uh, Yugoslavia, I can't comment on that. Um, I don't know. Can, can, can either of our other panelists comment on it? Mr. London? No comment. No. I do defense. Right. But, 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 but there is, there's a second part to this, which is there are other nations out there that are actively developing cyber attack capabilities aimed at the U.S. And you can find in the public record officials in China and Russia. I know nothing. Uh, I think what he's saying is that they're building organized cyber or cyber war capabilities. Is that what you're saying? No. I'm not aware of any of that. Jim? I, I sure hope we're doing that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we use cruise missiles, and we do. We, we should use any technique and tool available to us. But you know, we used a lot of uh, uh, cruise missiles in uh, Yugoslavia. But I wouldn't want you guys to have them and use them when you want them. And you know, you know. Yeah, really. <laughs> Eventually, they'll figure out how to build them anyway. <laughs> Phil has a comment. I don't know how well this is working. Okay, it is. Um, for years, uh, when your parents were growing up and I was still in high school, we were talking about an arms race. We were talking about the Cold War, countermeasures and measures. I submit to you that today we are in an arms race. The arms race today is a cyber arms race. Uh, it is cheaper and sometimes, I guess you could imagine, more effective to keep a ship from leaving port uh, because you have fouled up the navigation system than it is to let that sucker sail and blow it out of the water. It is just a new weapon. We're very concerned that those capabilities that are being developed out there by kitty scripters and other folks will eventually be picked up and realized what kind of value they could actually be. When that value is truly realized, we're not talking about replacing somebody's web page. We're talking about killing folks, and that we remain very concerned about. Yes, we are in an arms race, and it is on today. In the back. I was, I, I was distracted for a second as I was handing the... Uh, more money. More Answer money. It. Yes, more money. There is more money. There's uh, a lot of money. There's, there's more money. The, there's three major new threats that have emerged over the last eight years for Americans. There's chemical and biological weapons, and you've heard about the concerns about anthrax. There's the concerns about using radioactive and radiological weapons. And thirdly, there's a concern about cyber attacks. Attack. I deal with cyber attack. It's a real threat. There are real nasty people out there who are developing capabilities armed, aimed at the U.S. And the federal government has, has dramatically increased the amount of funding. By how much? By about 40 percent. How much is that? Well, that's a billion. It'll be a billion and a half this next year. We expect quite a considerable amount going forward. A lot of that's going to be in R&D. A lot of that is going to be in training and education. Uh, frankly, for some of the people out here, for information security. Mm -hmm. 
nod your head yes. <laughs> Let me see if I can address that. You know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. You've heard that. Reaction to an action is also very similar in this extent. You've had a couple lawyers talk to you guys today, talking to you. In essence, it may, they may not have said it, but they're talking about the development of case law. Many of the things that are going on today for prosecution and so forth, no one's ever done it before. Okay, not sure what the, the countermeasure to the measure ought to be, as I mentioned. But if you think about some of our other countries on this, on this planet, the way they counter uh, hackers, I will bring you back to a story not too long ago from China. Two hackers busted into a national Chinese bank, ripped off $37,000. They were caught. You know what their punishment was? They were shot. Okay. I'm telling you, that, that's perhaps so, okay? Do we do that in the United States? And the answer is no. I don't know of any, any hacker that can go out so, so are you saying that we're still in the transition period trying to figure out what, I, what an accurate I, punishment is? I think, I think that it will be a number of years before we have case law that is a standard as burglary crimes are today. Uh, I just have one comment. How many of out here ha have gone to jail for hacking? Not a whole lot of you, huh? So, uh, you know, I... <laughs> they're, they're in the pimp suites. <laughs> uh, did you guys go to jail? Uh, no, they have a question. Just check. Okay. Okay, that might work on the whole side of the problem. And, uh, we didn't say, I'm a good guy, but not on your side, personally. I'm just reason why I can't say, I want to join the good guys. Yes, I have, I have two important comments to make about, about that. The first is that, as was pointed out before, with the growth of the internet, with the growth of electronic commerce the way it is, case law and societal norms about how we treat this is an evolution. And it's not the government that sets and determines that. It's going to be a combination of congressional state action and individual decisions by courts and uh, by private plaintiffs in terms of that. And you have to be part of that process. We don't set all of that. 
that. We don't make it all up. It's a process that involves all of us, and it certainly is a process in evolution. I don't claim that the current case law and the current laws that we have for protecting electronic communications privacy and information security are perfect. They've changed. The technology is changing. And we have to recognize that we're in evolution right now. So what I would ask is cut us a break in terms of saying you, the government, are doing this and recognize the fact that we're in a rapid transition. The Congress is going to be involved in this. The state legislatures are going to be involved in this. And a lot of lawyers and court action are going to be involved. S second point is, in terms of sharing information with the government, one of the things we're working very carefully on right now is to make certain that the sort of case that you're involved in right there, where you are tracking somebody down and the like, that we have the mechanisms in place so that you can talk to us or talk to law enforcement as appropriate and not face the concerns about overreaction. It's a big issue. It's an issue we've never faced before. It raises a number of legal issues, both in terms of how corporations and lawyers look at it, as well as in terms of security and how law enforcement looks at it. But we are working on that very much. I think it's not going to be but I don't want to send them to jail for four years. That's the idea. That's good. That's good. In the back with the glasses. You say that you want someone like to come on your side, yet you get to do what we do and practice our training, but then you prosecute for us. So how is it that you don't want to possess the skills to do all the investigations you want to come to help you and you prosecute the rest of us to gain those skills? And second, what are you doing to educate the investigators to do these kinds of things? Well, there, there are several different categories of folks uh, that uh, didn't violate the law and have the same capability that you have. The problem is, like, uh, is scope. Like, like I said in a couple of my slides, you can target individual systems. You can work when you want. Uh, our folks have to protect everything, which is a huge problem. And, and we have good people out there who have uh, a good set of morals. Um, and and what, what, I, what we need for you guys to do is before you get caught, before you've caused damage and ruined potential job security in the future, is to come to our side because you're going to get those same capabilities and you probably get better tools and you'll find out what the challenge really is. Okay. Money. Oh, my land. Yeah, I understand your process and the procedure involved in doing all these things. That's all really good. But, okay, if you want to think, but what part is driven by someone wanting to get the film back in the result? He basically said what, what part of this process is driven by getting a federal indictment under their belt? I'm, I'm not a prosecutor, I'm an investigator, yeah. so my job is See, to... See, if you paid your $8.95 in advance, you could have heard the Department of Justice guy at Black Hat. <laughs> and, and like I said earlier, when we start an investigation, we don't know who the bad guy is. We're not looking for script kitties. We're looking for uh, the folks who have uh, uh, can cause significant damage. So now that we run an investigation, it turns out to be a 21-year-old. Should we just turn our back? I don't think so. I'm going to, the, part of the issue is, the question is, are some of the prosecutions just based off of uh, somebody trying to uh, simply get an additional uh, prosecution or indictment under their belt? I'm going to answer that from the perspective of the National Security Council at the White House and the focus that we're putting on cybersecurity right now. Uh, and I'll speak from that perspective and the, the funding and the, the focus that we're putting on that. We're concerned about threats to our economic and our national security that are not individual hackers. They're not disgruntled insiders. They're well-organized, well-funded, malicious groups that are trying to destroy our country. There are, country, there are countries and there are terrorist groups. Are you, are you at liberty to say them, this? I mentioned two of them earlier. You said China and Russia. Right. I've publicly talked about this. There are others. 
Stand up. Loud. Screw crypto laws. Let's go with Jeffrey Hunker on that from the National Security Council. <laughs> because we don't want strong encryption in the hands of terrorists. <laughs> already have strong encryption. Well, Okay. Sharing our privacy if we if we can't do it for ourselves. Could I have an easier question, please? There is. Okay. Strong encryption is available to all Americans. The the public key encryption and the key escrow proposals that have been made have the sort of legal protections to protect Americans' privacy rights. Go ahead. Earlier you said that uh, groups that are just exposing problems are really being the attention of the public. Uh, rats are not going to be consistent. Do you oppose activity groups such as the law who aren't maliciously cracking or like they purchase a product on their own to expose deep, deep legal things? Yes, and saying the other guys are opposed to no, I, I think that's a great thing. Absolutely. You know, but as soon as you violate the law by breaking somebody else's privacy, that's a whole different issue. To, to test products, to uh, hone your skills on your own systems or with permission, that's, that's great. And that's the kind of people that we want. to summarize this, it has to do Why with... Why can't the law to reverse engineer without getting in trouble? Is that what right. you're saying? Right. <laughs> right. I'm not an expert in this, and so I'm just going to speak from a personal capacity. I think that the language in the WIPO treaty was, did not, was not written with the intent of... Um, 
making illegal the sort of reverse engineering that you're talking about, and we hope to clarify and rectify that, that issue. Good. Good. Also, someone asked me to interject that um, with PKI e-commerce that you mentioned in the government having an interest in supporting that, that isn't it a fact that it would only require the injection of a subpoena to... Well, if we need so how, how, again, so it goes back to how, how much is the government really ensuring our privacy for us? You know, the, the whole issue of PKI and key recovery is part of an ongoing dialogue. And if people feel that there needs to be a stronger legal protections, then let's have stronger legal protections. The Congress is considering it. The administration is considering it. It's going to be part of case law. Uh, let's build them in. Congress. Uh, we we Congress and Senate. That'll be effective. You had a question in the back. Please speak up loudly. Key I'm not touching <laughs> I, I wish the FBI were here. <laughs> Does someone have a non-PKI key escrow e-commerce question in the main shirt? Okay, there's been a lot of talk about, well, before we got on Got I'm not really sure I like you. <laughs> In fact, uh, if there's anybody from Global Hell here, I'd like to meet him. It, um, this is an issue where you have uh, a, backup num a number of backup servers, and quite frankly, we had an oops. Um, one of the backup servers wasn't fully backed up properly, and that doggone temp file was still there. And someone exploited that. Um, it is not a big sin, but it was because it was very public. Uh, those kind of things, I'm afraid, will happen on any system that you have. System administrators, if you are one, you know 
you're overworked, there isn't enough hours in the day just to maintain continuity of operation in your systems. And if you look at all the advisories, advisories that are out there, whether they come out of Carnegie Mellon, whether they come out of the Assist, whether they come out of 101 other places, uh, I question whether we will ever have the capability to implement all of them in a secure manner. Red team in place that will actually help when the advisory comes out with a serious block in the areas. It goes and checks your people, your organization. I, I, yeah, I, I don't think you realize how huge we are. I mean, oh, seriously. Let's, uh, I think let's not, you know, I mean... <laughs> I mean, you know, the problem the problem is education and training. You know, the system administrators that we have, their job and their priority is to keep the thing up and running, and it never has been security. Now security has become a priority, and they don't have the training and education to make this thing work. Right. So it's, it's going to take time, and it's going to take resources, and, and the problem that we have in the government is as soon as we train them, then the private sector buys them. I would like a, hey, I'd like to get paid more too. Absolutely agree. Yeah. Question? The issue has to do with product liability for, uh, I guess, mostly for software. Say it. Right. You know you want to sell it. Pardon? It's a good question. I'm glad you brought it up. And we're looking at it. I would like nothing more. <laughs> Wait, did you say you would like nothing more than... I would like nothing more to, than to have some uh, more market incentives out there to ensure that if products are going to be put out on the market, that they do what they're said to, that they're supposed to be doing. I mean, you do that with cars. I think that should be true for information systems as well. <laughs> Let me uh, comment on, on, on this as well. I obviously can't talk from the White House because that's not where I work. But let me tell you what we are looking at from a Department of Defense perspective. In fact, the Department of the Army is driving this particular initiative. Everything that we buy, uh, we buy generally under contract. So we develop the specification characteristics in the deliverables. Uh, we do that predominantly against COTS because that's what the mandate by Congress has been. They have reduced our, uh, our development R&D uh, resources and so forth that we have to go commercial. However, in those contracts, we are now stating very specifically that the applications that we buy have to have some sort of guarantee that there is no malicious code, virus-free, and they operate as intended. Now, the big hammer is, you don't deliver, we don't buy from you again. He said the word. He said the M word. We do buy from Microsoft, okay? But I will tell you, I will tell you that we have we have increased our uh, our cooperation in the area of security with the Microsoft folks out of Washington. They have they have come out with some rather interesting solutions to the problem that you all uh, have brought out uh, in the past DevCon. <laughs> We're still defending this country, aren't we? <laughs> okay, qu question over there on the side. Loud, please. Very good comment. Very good question.
The question, the question is, if if the concern is lowest price, what is the problem with open source? That's a really good question. <laughs> And we are looking at that very carefully. That's the White House guy. When you said that you guys are defending the United States, there are people in here that I'm sure are veterans that are defending the United States, but are not choosing in their own businesses to be a student and to continue buying a lot of products. So why is the arms that continue to buy a lot of products? And he gets sex to the CIA. and counter measures. I was wondering um, whether or not you would agree with the assertion that uh, corporations, groups, uh, even individuals have a right to develop and test those same kinds of techniques. You know, we see the application of them as something for the attorneys general and the lawyers to worry about. But would you agree that people should have the right to develop and test the same kinds of techniques as defense against other parties or Absolutely, as long as you don't test them on somebody else who doesn't know it and doesn't consent to it. Sure. That's a very good question. I really have no comment on that. I mean, it's... <laughs> It gets into so many issues of legal liability, uh, civil liability for organizations that want to hack back, um, and take countermeasures, and the like. Uh, I know that it's something that people have been looking at, thinking about, and maybe doing, uh, but it raises a whole bunch of issues. Are, are you just talking about testing your own products in your own environment, or are you talking about going out and developing tools and techniques on somebody else, an innocent bystander? Developing tools and techniques that could be used against other parties. It's not easy to do with all these problems. You're doing it in your own environment, though, right? You're doing a missile, but not launching something. I don't have a problem with that. Question? Loud. Loud. Louder. Oh, I got two things, actually. One, does it, you say you're the good guys, right? Does it bother you that without us, we wouldn't be here to document problems and how to face them so that some, you know, real malicious group actually could come and attack them? Comment, comment. Phil will comment. Basically he said, does it bother you that the people in this room, the people here at DEF CON are the ones finding the vulnerabilities? Would you prefer it be us to find them before somebody else come along and, and find them and exploit you? Like one of these terrorist groups that you've referred to or, yeah, the, the gut or answer, intelligence services? The gut answer at 2 o'clock in the morning, it bothers the hell out of me. The other answer, though, from an academic perspective, this is the kind of conferences where this kind of information can be exchanged. And if you don't think that it is being exchanged, it certainly is. These are the kind of conferences that you should kind of applaud yourselves because you're the kind of folks that are actually making the industry more conscious of what the hell they're putting out there. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Well, if we're only listening to you once a year, we certainly want to have a better track record so that you can't say that next year. Your second question? How much are the jobs that you, how much do the jobs pay? How much do you make now? <laughs> 
How much do you make now? You, you're up now. <laughs> he makes eight fifteen hour, everybody. He, he has the next round. Okay, you. Loud. Jeffrey's here. When was the last time you had someone at DEF CON from the White House? The point is that the government has a lot of trouble communicating amongst itself as well as with private industry, and so what are we doing about making certain that we actually have a, a full picture? The President 18 months ago signed a couple of executive orders, specifically reorganizing the federal government so that we do, in fact, for the first time, have in the White House, my position was created as well as the position of another person at the National Security Council, specifically to coordinate all the work that's taking place across the federal agencies. Uh, we've also created a special unit that for the first time has brought together the FBI and the Secret Service and the intelligence community, and is frankly working very close, starting to work very closely with the private sector in terms of exchange information about the sort of new threat that we're talking about. So can we email you? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you want my address? What? Yes. It's Jeffrey dot uh, underscore a dot underscore hunker at nsc dot eop dot gov. J E F F R E Y underscore A period underscore hunker H U N K E R. <laughs> Question? Okay, we, we only have time for a couple more questions, so who's going to be aggressive? This guy asked first, but you got to listen. What, he, he made an observation in regards to the comment earlier. Instead of saying it's a house that you're leaving unsecured, consider it a business, and someone walks into your business after hours where, when it's unlocked, there's a certain level of responsibility in securing them. And so it, was a, it was an is, observation. And part part of, of that is education and awareness. Some people don't know that they need to lock their doors. And that, that's a lot of what the government's doing, is doing education and awareness. And then how do you and how do you pay for securing that, that particular system, your house. Everybody can't afford to put an alarm on their on their house. Go ahead. And in neighborhoods, in some neighborhoods, you need them. Regarding HIPAA, the health information 
Privacy Protection Act. Like protection medical records and so forth. There's no a requirement to have adequate protection in place by 2001. Are there similar legislative um, activities going on to protect areas outside of health information? Not yet in terms of mandating it. We'd much prefer to be working on a voluntary basis. Uh, if that doesn't work, then maybe somebody will propose it, but that's certainly not something that's on the cards right now. We have one minute. You mentioned earlier tribal warfare. So what do you think that I can say about everybody on this side of the table without telling anyone else in the room? Is the one now I think we all fight every day is the war against stupidity. <laughs> That's, that's really a good statement. I like it. It's a really good question. <laughs> Well, I think this has been an interesting Meet the Fed panel. We are down to no time. Is, is our next speaker here? You, are you the next speaker? How, do you think that this was a beneficial addition to the con this year? Then we'll do it again next year. We'll see who shows up. And also, Philip Moringer will be speaking tomorrow at 10 a.m. He's the army guy.